Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Bob Corker opts out of the Senate. What's next for the Confederate statues, the fairgrounds, and more tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by Toby Sells, news editor at the Memphis Flyer. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Eric. And Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. And so, Bill, uh, as I said at the top, Bob Corker, uh, senator from Tennessee, has decided not to run again. Um, lots of consternation and surprise on the national level. I think I, we had a sense. I, I was not that surprised that he chose not to. And he was on the show, what, a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. And it's not that he explicitly said you could just tell some hesitancy, and, and other people have said this, that he was not, you know, 100% certain he wanted to do this again. Well, and, and the longer that he put off making an announcement about what he was going to do, the, the, the more this possibility started to become real and, and solidify. Um, so, yeah, Bob Corker is the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, one of the most important committee chairmanships in the United States Senate. And uh, so, so this is big news nationally. He had been uh, on the short list for Secretary of State. Uh, so, so you've got that reaction. Meanwhile, at, at the state level, even if Bob Corker completely walks away from life as an elected official, he has disrupted really two races. The first is the race for his Senate seat. The second is the race for governor the other statewide position that where you mount a statewide campaign. Some which of the, is also in 2018, yeah, which is the same cycle, the exact mm, same, time. same same election cycle. And peop, in some ways, not always the same consideration. So some of the people, particularly the Republicans who are in that race for governor, are at least going to take a look at running right. for Senate. Is there a path to elected office there that is perhaps easier right. for a particular candidate than running for for governor. And did, did Bob Corker say whether he was going to run for governor? Did, did he rule it out completely? How, was he coy? He, he did what politicians do so well. He said nothing yeah. about that, which yeah. means it, 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 to, to people like me, that means he didn't rule right. it out. Right. And, and that's what it means to politicos yeah. a, a, as well. So, you know, the, the, there is that whole thing. Is Corker going to run for governor? That was a scenario that had been talked about pretty early on, that Corker might not run for re-election, but he might run for governor. Right. And Haslam, who is term limited, Bill Haslam, the governor of this state of yours and mine, uh, might decide to right. run for the United States yeah. Senate. And he did not rule it out when asked. He's, he's not been ruled asked it before out and hasn't and, ruled it out. And, and uh, Corker has said that, that Haslam is one of uh, three or four people that he thinks are serious yeah. contenders for this. Yeah. Toby, you want to speculate here? You want to play the name game oh, of sure. how this muddies everything up? Yeah, I mean, this is a your thoughts. political parlor game when something like this is afoot. You know, here's a thing, and like you said, it shuffles everybody around. Uh, and all names are on the table, I think, for all these races for governor or for, for the Senate seat now. Uh, one interesting one that I'll put out there that, uh, that may seem a little silly, but uh, there was some speculation months ago that maybe Peyton Manning had some, uh, some political uh, uh, willingness out there. And then just yesterday, I got a news release uh, that he and the Haslams, Bill Haslam and, and his wife, uh, they'd worked together on a Pat Head Summit uh, fundraiser. So he's kind of getting his name out there, associated his name with, uh, with some folks out there. I read it, the tea leaves, and that's all that is, but uh, it's pretty interesting speculation. Yeah. Yeah. The other part of it is, so if you do go through here, and I've talked to some people you know, since this came out, um, you've got, if Haslam runs for the Senate, that, that's one very distinct possibility. You've got Marsha Blackburn with the, the current representative, Republican mm -hmm. representative from District 9. Am I right about that? District 8. Uh, District 7. 7, actually. thank you. I knew I knew that. Um, <laughs> you've got Diane Black. So then, so you've got those people. Then you've got the people, as you said, Bill, the people who are already declared for governor. Randy Boyd, 
clearly if 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 Corker runs, that's probably a problem for Randy Boyd mm -hmm. because Randy Boyd is running as this, hey, it's be Haslam 2.0 continuation, former economic development commissioner. He's put a lot of work in around the state. But his message is going to overlap pretty distinctly with Bob Corker's, right? Then you've got Diane Black. Is she interested in running Nashville? Uh, as I said, what she, she represents Nashville, Nashville area, mm. is a Republican. Um, but who else with the governors? How else does that scramble things, do you think? Um, well, you, you, you could also uh, have um, uh, Bill Lee, I, I, I think, who, who's a wealthy businessman from, from Franklin, Tennessee, uh, who has been coming along? Um, who who knows what happens with his campaign? Does yeah. it help it, or or does it hurt right. it? I mean, I mean, Corker is Cor Corker in the governor's race would be a some the effect of someone doing a big cannonball into a pretty <laughs> small swimming sure. pool. Right. Yeah. And you know? in terms of financing, in terms of awareness, yeah. campaign apparatus, and all that stuff, we are exclusively talking about Republicans. There is another party, and that is the Democrats, Toby. Does this, any sense, again, just speculating the par parlor game of this, any switch, any change, any more likelihood in such a dominantly red state that this opens the door on either as for a Democratic governor or a Democratic senator? I don't think so. Uh, not not right now. Not in these uh, not in these days. Of course, Carl Dean is still out there. Former Nashville mayor is going out there, uh, running for governor. Running for governor. And um, Craig Fitzhugh, the, the minority leader in the House from the Jackson, Tennessee area. Right. And and I don't see uh, how the waves would, would ever spill over there. Like Bill said, I mean, it's just going to be a big cannonball on the Republican side, and that's probably the way it's going to go. Uh, you know, in, in these elections, of course, I can't you know tell the future, but uh, but I don't see how it disrupts the the Democratic race at all. But maybe you have other thoughts on it. No, know. I mean, I mean, Car Carl Dean has has a plan that is pretty set on running for governor, and I don't think he's going to uproot right. a lot of hard work because of something that's happening uh, on on the other side uh, yeah. of the aisle. By the same token, Andy Burke, who's the mayor of Chattanooga, mm -hmm. who had been talked about as a candidate for governor, is now looking at the Senate race yeah. on the Democratic yeah, side. So, so what, you, what, what you might see is, is this crop of relatively new mayors across the state who are Democrats, who, who are trying to make up their mind. And I think a lot of those guys had already ruled out the race for governor, and now are right. are looking at the Senate race. We should also mention back on the Republican side, uh, Congre former Congressman Stephen Fincher, uh, who who opted not to run for for re-election this last time yeah. in 2016. Uh, he had said when he made the announcement that if one of the Senate seats came open in, for 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 mm. Tennessee, that he was interested in that. Uh, Fincher is is looking really yeah. hard at the Senate race. And the other one that should be mentioned that, that it was meant, talked about was uh, Mark Green. So Mark Green, yeah. a state senator, uh, former uh, uh, military, almost got a, what, which I can't remember which job, but he, almost got a job he, he in the was, Trump administration. He was nominated by Trump for uh, Secretary of the Army. Thank you. The comments he had made as a legislator on a number of issues right. really made him a lightning rod. Uh, so he dropped out of that. But but Green had been running for governor pretty early on on the Republican side. So when he dropped out, the immediate thought was, well, he's going to get back in the race for governor. And he said, no, I'm, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And, um, and May Beavers, I mean, you know, she's, Beavers, thank she's you. Yeah. a very, you know, far right uh, a uh, Republican in the state, a lot of you know red meat issues that she does. Maybe this opens up an easier path, like you said, for her to run for for Senate yeah. instead, saying you know the the time is right for these kind of issues uh, for Tennesseans, and maybe it'd be easy for me to get the, there. The other thing will be just interesting, and then we'll move on to local issues. But is you know the um, the national low approval ratings for Trump. Obviously, he's going to be more uh, have higher ratings in Tennessee. I haven't seen recent polls on that, but it'll be interesting if, if this thing becomes a bit of a referendum on Trump. Corker has spoken out, being disappointed in Trump, but, and you've got these kind of mainstream candidates in the, the kind of centrist wing of the Republican Party, and then, like you said, May Beavers and maybe Diane Black and, and Mark Green certainly. You know, do they push more under the banner of Trump, mm -hmm. the Tennessee Republicans, in that direction? Let's move on, though, again, locally to uh, a couple of things that happened this week. Um, Edmund Ford uh, declared, current city councilman, part of the Ford family, political dynasty family, et cetera. He is declared uh, for county commission. Is that correct? Yes. He's going to run for the Shelby. This is 
fo follow the. Uh, yeah, we need a grid here. We need a, we need <laughs> yeah, a chart. Really, you know, we need really some graphics. Uh, Edmund Ford of the Memphis City Council is running for the county commission seat that his cousin, Justin Ford, cannot run for re-election to because he is term limited. Yeah. Uh, so is Edmund Ford, uh, who, is, who is actually in his third term on the council, but the term limits kicked in after he had been elected to his first term. So he's also term limited in 2019. So he's kicked off his campaign uh, and and there are all kinds of dynamics versus the Ford family dynamic. If if Edmund Ford wins the county commission seat and resigns from the council seat, will Justin Ford then <laughs> run for the uh, yeah <laughs> run run for the appointment to the council seat and then run for election to the council seat in 2019? That council seat has has been held. The city council seat has been held by a member of the Ford family since 1971 when wow. John Ford was elected to it. The, the um, county commission seat that Justin Ford has has been held by a member of the Ford family since 1994, with the brief exception of Edith Moore holding the seat when uh, Joe Ford became interim county yeah, You mayor. would definitely win Shelby County Commissioner Bingo. Like, or, like <laughs> any kind of trivia, bingo, any game on that, like that, that Edith Moore would be the winner. Yeah. Uh, your thoughts on this? Also, in, in, we taped this uh, this week, uh, Thursday morning, but David Lenore is expected to announce uh, a much talked about run for county uh, mayor. Terry Rowland, uh, county commissioner, has already declared, declared what, a year ago? Right. Um, any th thoughts on this stuff? Uh, everything I know, I read from uh, Jackson Baker's column in the Memphis Flyer. He's, uh, he's our political dean over there, and he had some interesting stuff in this week's paper uh, about some of the fundraisers uh, that, that these folks were having, especially one by Terry uh, Rowland up in Millington, where he kind of painted uh, his two opponents there. Uh, he painted David Lenore as uh, Mr. Drysdale which from uh, the Beverly Hillbillies. I don't know if you get that. He's the rich banker, this guy with a lot of money. Um, and then uh, on the other side was uh, Joy Tuliatis who uh, he basically painted as uh, Jim Strickland 2.0. And uh, so he's, he's, trying to, he's trying to get his wedge in there. That's how he's painting himself. You know, we've uh, you know, we got to upheaval this thing and, and get new, new blood at the top. Uh, uh, so that's kind of where he is. I thought it was an interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we should say on the Democratic side, the only declared candidate is Sidney Chisholm. Is that Sydney correct? Sidney Chisholm so far. That, that former is, county commissioner. For, yeah, former yeah. county commissioner. That is going to change. Yeah, that others will get in. Mm -hmm. And again, and we'll move on to some other things, but it is interesting, you know, Lenore has been talked about as a future uh, Shelby County Mayor for a long time, and from the trustee's office and, and, and moving there, and everyone thought it was sort of a cakewalk of him being an establishment guy, the hooks, the centrist, the kind of person people would want in that role among Republicans, and then Trump won. And Terry Rowland suddenly became, for a lot of people who said to me off the record, Oh, suddenly Terry seemed a lot more viable in a way that they didn't think he was in terms of running against Dave Lenore. So that, that's an interesting thing right now. Let's switch over to uh, the fairgrounds I mentioned at the top of the show. We are moving closer, it seems, to some sort of um, final plan, right? There's mm -hmm. a TDZ, tur a Tourism Development uh, Zone, uh, incentives from the state, the, the application or the extension. They've got to get a plan in there soon right. to the state. By the end of the year. By the end of the year. You want to go through, Bill, I mean, some of the things talked about, and then we'll let you talk about the, Col sure. the Coliseum, but for the fairgrounds separate from the Coliseum, what's being talked about now? Um, the latest iteration, keep in mind that we'll have what is pretty much the final plan in November on this. What, what we are talking about now at this stage is that um, the Coliseum remains. The Coliseum remains a 4,999 seat venue of some sort so as not to invoke the Grizzlies no compete clause which came to life uh, rather suddenly <laughs> earlier this month That's when right. Graceland <laughs> announced plans for a 6,000 seat venue. Uh, also you, you would have a hotel on the Central Avenue frontage probably next to the Children's Museum of Memphis at least in the city's site tentative site plan. Always emphasize tentative. Uh, <clears throat> then you, you would have uh, uh, the Fairview High School building, which is now home to the Maxine Smith Steam Academy, would lose its gymnasium on the back and would get a new gymnasium, a bigger gymnasium, in back of the Croc Center, which opens up the Central Avenue frontage for some kind of retail development. And the high school football field surrounded by the outdoor track oval would move from its Central Avenue frontage over to where Liberty Land used to be in the southwest <coughs> corner 
yeah. of the property. And then and still the whole the premises in terms of paying for some of this is youth sports. So more fields, more sports, is that correct? That 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 uh, you know indoor volleyball, outdoor baseball fields, a lot of these kind of what I jokingly would call professional sports for kids where they are traveling baseball, traveling traveling teams. Is that that's still a big yeah, part of this? Yeah, but it but it's nowhere near as as much of the site as as it was during the Wharton administration plans. On yeah. Thoughts on all this? Well, the uh, you know, amateur youth sports, that's certainly the focus of the coalition, uh, the Coliseum Coalition, who's been working. Uh, they just released a business plan uh, a week or two ago uh, that kind of spells out how they would go about uh, reopening and, and making viable the, the Coliseum over there. Uh, they would have the venue inside and they would open that up to graduation, certainly, uh, concerts, all the other things, but uh, their main focus would be uh, youth and amateur sports. So you'd have volleyball tournaments, basketball tournaments, those kind of things in there. Uh, and that was really one of the big, uh, the, the biggest things that was going to keep that place open, you know, the revenue from that. So uh, I know they have a focus on that because that's what makes money. They've told me, I mean, you know, uh, there's no nostalgia in their plan. They say this is the thing that's going to make this thing viable. Uh, so at least for them, youth sports is certainly a focus, but yeah, certainly not on the level of, of Wharton's plan. And you wrote, Bill, there's some concern. So Fred Jones from the Southern Heritage Classic was on the show in the last month or so talking about the fairgrounds, talking about other things. There's some concern that he's expressed about them reducing the number of, of potentially reducing the number of parking spaces as they, you know, open up parts of the Liberty Land that now is mm -hmm. green, gets used, becomes fields, et cetera. There's talk of a parking garage to 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 compensate for those lost open spaces, green spaces, right? But he's a little wary that he wants to yeah. see it hard and fast that there is there is enough parking for that Southern Heritage Classic for and for Tigers football. He, he is wary, and the other two football tenants at the Liberty Bowl, the University of Memphis and the AutoZone Liberty Bowl game, uh, are 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 very wary of what they've seen, uh, even though it is tentative. Because the first thing they noticed was that they lose three thousand parking spaces. Mm -hmm many of those on the grass in the Liberty Land area. And the parking garage, while it is talked about, uh, it, it is, not, is not on the site plan. And the location of it is, is kind of nebulous, at least at this point. There's some talk about it would be on the north end, maybe on the Central Avenue frontage, maybe not. But they want something more definite. And the first thing they yeah. noticed was 3,000 parking right. spaces not there. Right, right. Thoughts? Uh, just back on the TDZ, all that would be paid for by, you know, the tourist development zone money, which would, you know, kind of capture local sales tax and put it back onto debt payments. Yep. Uh, city officials are also working uh, to refine the TDZ for, for downtown. That's going to help pay for the, the Bicentennial Gateway Project. Uh, I think I said that right. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, it would expand Convention that. Convention center, potentially. All that. Pinch district and so on. Thank and uh, I think they're going to have, uh, they're going to have a plan to the State Building Commission in November. Uh, and, and see if they can get that uh, expansion approved, which of course would, you know, uh, could help the riverfront, St. Jude plans, uh, all those things. So we've got a couple of different TDZs uh, that we're working to the state right. right now. Right, okay. And gets back to the convention center, you may have just said that, but this hotel motel tax and the work that's beginning that they've, they've approved to, to begin to renovate to some degree the, the convention center. Short of a, a billion dollar, you know, we've had Ken Kane from the Convention Visitors Bureau on, there is no plan for some 500 to, to $1 billion Music City massive convention center, but certainly he makes the case and others make the case of expanding what they have and improving the kind of outdated facilities there. Yeah. And that also is part of this. Probably right? about a $60 million yeah. renovation of the yeah. convention okay. center. Which gets into some news about hotels, just real quickly that, you know, it is, you know, Kevin Kane, again, from the Convention Visitors Bureau, has worried that, that this incentive money that has gone to small hotels mm -hmm. would take away from the potential for a convention center hotel. So a lot of talk now about what whether one will get built, uh, the, the 100 North Main building, which was an office building, does that get converted into convention centers? And then two hotels got announced this last week, building permits pulled for one right mm -hmm. downtown in a, a kind of blighted area right next to our office, it happens mm -hmm. to me. Um, and then also the one that's been empty, what was it called before it was, uh, th that's right across from the, the uh, Redbird Stadium that sat, oh, uh, it, it, they started it, demolition it was, it and gutting the, and then it sat right. there for about two, three years. It was empty. called the Benchmark Hotel uh, in, in, in the 1980s. There's been some other brands after that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, but, but the thing is that a lot of the hotel proposals that surfaced uh, 
kind of didn't start moving toward definitely happening until after basically the downtown Memphis Commission had said, we're not going to use the hotel incentives for, for those. There may be some out there that, that, that have them, but I think they reacted to the floodgates opening on the on yeah. the hotels and motels pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, we'll move, we've got about six minutes left here, to the, st the status of, of the statues. Um, Bill, where are we in terms of the city and the forest statue that's it's in the medical district um, and their application to the state to, to take the statue down? Well, the city of Memphis, the Strickland administration, goes before the Historical Commission next month, October 13th, I believe. That's right. Uh, which is meeting in, in Athens, Tennessee. They move their meeting sites around. And the city is going to seek a waiver from the state law that allows it to take down the statue of Nathan Bedford Force. That's all the application is for. And in talking with Bruce McMullen, who is the city's chief legal officer, city attorney, this is pretty complex. It involves what, what, what if any, rules the the Historical Commission will adopt on that day that are not yet in place. Do they adopt those on a long-term basis? And then if they do, do they adopt them on an emergency basis? Because if they don't adopt them on an emergency basis, they can't vote on the matter when it comes up that particular day. And the city very much wants a vote on it that day. And, you know, so let's say for a second, and, and I think Alan Way, the, the counsel to the city council, the lawyer to the city council, um, and others have said there's just a, a very low chance that the Historic Commission is going to vote to give Memphis permission to do this. That's and right. So what, I mean, now we're in the world of speculation and rumor. What, what happens next? I mean... Alan Wade said we're going to call out the dogs. Uh, yeah. Did he say that? I think, yeah, I think he said that in a council meeting. And I don't know exactly what that means, but they're going to get tough uh, and, and find a uh, plan B and a plan C until they can make a movement on this. But what that means, I would not even speculate because yeah. I really don't know. Yeah. But uh, I, I think plan B is going to be the council's ordinance, which they vote on next week on okay. third and final reading, that says, that says these are the grounds that we, we are going to use to remove the statue that have nothing to do with the historical commission or right. requiring that, that, that their permission. And if the statue is, if the historical commission doesn't grant approval for this on the 13th, then we're gonna act on the ordinance and the ordinance calls for the removal of not only the Forest statue, but the Jefferson Davis statue as well in another downtown park. And uh, for, for the administration, if they're denied, They'll go to Chancery Court in Davidson yeah. County and seek a court injunction. And I've said this before, but people pointed out there's there is some weird, you know, and we've talked about it on the show some way in which they, the the parks can give them away. I still don't understand that mechanism where the statues can be given away. I've heard that talked about sure. in some legal maneuver. And again, the council is clearly 13-0 wants these things gone. And I'm also struck by. Um, and then people are very concerned what happens when the legislature goes back in session and what rules could get changed to limit options even more with a very conservative legislature. Um, but I haven't heard or seen, and maybe it's just me and people can tweet me or whatever, but people stepping up and saying, no, no, no. People in Memphis saying, no, those statues need to stay. I, I, oh, people, they're there. They well, I haven't. I, oh, yeah. I, it's just be the circles I'm in, apparently. Well, well I mean, who, what, the, the what people, are they saying? Because the we need to give fair sh a fair shake to them, and I don't mean to not. They, they don't think that the view. statue should be removed because the statues have been there. They equate it with rewriting history. Mm -hmm. uh, th this, is a, this is a very old discussion yeah. over. But any politicians that have come forward? Generation. Anybody in power who's come forward and said that? Uh, no. Right. No, I think that's maybe uh, what I mean. Among I, among among the political elected leaders who have a vote on this process, the only difference of opinion is how this happens, yeah. not that it does happen. That thing, that's I think right. that's what I was after. That it, it's been interesting compared to some other cities. Um, you want to talk a little bit about uh, some things going on at the the, cat, the legislature out of session, but they still do work and planning and some community some things you've reported on to it. Sure. The, uh, uh, the legislatures, uh, legislators have been busy up there in Nashville. Uh, usually when they put out an issue to summer study, that just means, hey, we don't want to talk about this anymore and it goes away. But uh, they took up a couple of issues this summer that, uh, that were really interesting. Um, the first one is uh, there was a House committee that just issued its uh, final recommendations uh, to the governor as far as what we do about the opioid crisis in, in the state. And there were some interesting things there. Uh, they, they want 25 more FBI or TBI agents, uh, Tennessee Bureau of Investigations agents, to, uh, uh, to help fight this. They want uh, some emergency medicines uh, distributed across the state to help people if they're in an overdose. Um, and, uh, and they want uh, more access to care and screenings and, and those kind of things. 
the thing that really struck me when I when I looked into it, I, I had heard that uh, a legislator say that there were around 2,000 opioid related deaths, overdose deaths uh, last year. And um, when I looked at the, the map from the Tennessee Department of Health, uh, most of the deaths and, and most of uh, uh, the, the folks that are that are taking these, uh, it's all it's an East Tennessee thing. It's it's very little of it was in was in West Tennessee. Yeah, um, there were uh, there were all but four counties in West Tennessee last year where people were taking more than uh, you know a high dose of opioids. There were like less than uh, and so uh, in some counties it was less than two and a half percent of the population. But then in some East Tennessee counties it was twelve uh, twelve and a half percent of the population out there were taking a lot of opioids. So I thought that was interesting to kind of see where, where this thing is happening out there. So, so they've got some recommendations. We'll see what they do when they come back in. Uh, there was another group, another uh, committee, a joint committee, joint uh, House and Senate committee that were looking at uh, the state's medical cannabis program. And, um, and they, were, they brought in experts, they brought in uh, health officials, law, or law enforcement, and, um, and they basically said, we hear the issues, we know the issues. Marijuana's coming, so get ready. All right. Well, that is all the time we have. We leave it on that note. Join us again next week. Thanks.